Hello and welcome. This is Karen Lundgren and I'm a Medical Affairs Manager at Nestle Health Science and I have the pleasure of moderating today's presentation entitled Adult Malnutrition Documentation Improvement Team Collaboration for Clinical Impact in the Hospital Setting. Financial support for this presentation was provided by Nestle Health Science. The views expressed are those of the presenter and do not necessarily represent Nestle's views. The material is accurate as of the date it was presented and is for educational purposes only and not intended as a substitute for medical advice. With that, I am very pleased to present today's speaker, Therese Scollard. Therese is owner of My Surgery Plate LLC and retired regional clinical nutrition manager with a large health system in the Pacific Northwest. Her undergraduate was taken at Eastern Washington University in Washington State. Her internship in dietetics at St. Mary's Hospital and Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, and Master of Business Administration at City University of Seattle. Teresa's focus is adult disease-related malnutrition and sarcopenia, surgical nutrition optimization and recovery, using nutrition informatics to reduce malnutrition, malnutrition documentation, nutrition-focused physical examination, and education for hand grip strength examination. She served on the malnutrition work group that created the 2012 Academy Aspen Consensus Characteristics of Adult Malnutrition. She is a member of the Aspen Malnutrition Committee, and she is a commissioner with the Commission on Dietetic Registration and is a recipient of a 2020 Excellence in Practice Management Award by the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. So a big welcome to Therese Scollard. Thank you, Karen, and welcome everyone. Thank you for taking the time today to attend this webinar. I really appreciate Nestle for supporting this education and hope that it will help you in your daily work in dealing with malnutrition documentation issues. These are my disclosures. And these are our learning objectives today. I would like to draw your attention also to a handout with links and information that I thought would be um, helpful for your notes. Since our time is so limited, I wanted to provide you with these resources for your further study. And my hope is that you can find some useful learning today to help yourself and your team's malnutrition documentation content and workflow. We will explore some opportunities that will hopefully help facilitate team communication and strengthen malnutrition documentation and co coding in your facilities. It's my opinion that by documenting clearly and well, we are actually advocating for our malnourished patients and promoting reductions in the incidence of protein calorie malnutrition because the data generated downstream from the coding not only shows what is going on in your own hospital, but downstream it publicly quantifies the reality of the consequences of malnutrition. Ultimately, this data is extracted and analyzed at national levels. Your documentation, therefore, lends voice in describing the distressful causes and consequences of malnutrition to our patients, communities, and to healthcare systems, as well as to the significance of the economic impact we find ourselves in now because of our current inadequate preventative infrastructure. Quality documentation of PCM is something we can each do every day to help make progress in patient care and support compliance with regulatory expectations also. Our quality documentation causes malnutrition to not be hidden from view, but allows it to be formally recognized so it can be better addressed with improved preventative efforts, you know, so for reduction and for uh, reduction in the incidence. So this is our agenda and hopefully will help us follow the sequence of information that we're gonna look at today. And I should explain how I came to be engaged in this topic because I'm not a medical coder or a documentation integrity professional. What happened was in 1990, my group at work started a malnutrition documentation workflow with the medical staff and coding. And then about 1996, I got a call from our director of coding with a request to review a medical case that had been questioned by some Medicare auditors. So I didn't really understand what that was, but that started an ongoing dialogue and experience about the documentation and coding issues that have brought us to today. 
what bothered me personally was that I was very disconcerted about the disconnect between what we were seeing clinically in patients with malnutrition and the denial of this situation by auditors. Hospitals overbilled Medicare $1 billion by incorrectly assigning severe malnutrition diagnosis codes to inpatient hospital claims. When I saw this last summer, I was sad. I work with so many diligent and professional clinicians across the country and locally who were every day trying to do the right care, follow protocols, document correctly, and find these very ill patients in our hospitals in order to treat them and prevent further decline. You know, professionals I know are very careful to avoid doing anything that could appear fraudulent or misleading. And that is why I was sad to see this. In fact, the federal agency that audits, the Office of Inspector General or OIG, has audited malnutrition coding over the last five years and found similar issues as in this report. And that said, collaboration by hospital professionals is critical to obtain accurate and complete documentation for code assignment by the medical coder. We as clinicians have to document in such a way as to be consistent and complete so that coding will be accurate for the downstream regulatory compliance, billing, and payment. We want to be exact in our documentation, not over or under describe the patient's true condition and treatment because undercoding is not right either because our patients then aren't counted. So this is what happened from the OIG audit. They took a random sample from 2015 to 2017 for severe protein calorie malnutrition cases. When they analyzed them, they found that there was this $1 billion overpayment for $3.4 billion in Medicare payments to hospitals for almost a quarter of a million inpatient claims between those two years. And the reported issues, they said, was they, that the problems they found were they, they use, people, hospitals use severe codes when they should have used codes for other forms of malnutrition or no malnutrition diagnosis at all. And for these claims, hospitals provided medical record documentation that did not contain evidence that the malnutrition was severe or that it had an effect on patient care. So I wanna repeat that. It did not contain evidence that the malnutrition was severe or that it had an effect on patient care. So these are two different concepts, the severity of diagnosis and the effect on, or the impact on patient care. So remember those points. Now, to show another view of this, this is an economic analysis of the burden of disease-related malnutrition to direct medical costs for eight disease, disease categories. And you can actually go into the links there and, and check your own state. And some of the eight categories were like COPD and heart disease and a stroke. Nationally, this was $15 trillion on the burden of of direct medical costs to hospitals. And the per person or per capita cost for that year of 2016 was $48. And then they extracted for people 65 plus, and it was $4 trillion and the per capita cost is 93. And what I find also interesting with this data is that we know that malnutrition is consistently underdiagnosed and undertreated, which makes the potential for this economic impact to be even greater. So what is all of this? Now, on the one hand, we have this group and others analyzing and communicating the significant problem we have in the US around and around the world with unprevented, underdiagnosed, and untreated malnutrition, including this expensive economic impact. And we have national professional organizations working very hard to get attention to this topic and create consensus criteria and medical and social changes to reduce malnutrition. And on the other hand, when we do identify it with our best clinical perspective in the hospital, payers can deny it is present. And you have, then you have me telling you that our team documentation is key to fixing this. So when we look at criteria for diseases, there are three types of criteria that should be met. There's research criteria, which we're not talking about today, clinical case criteria, such as the Academy Aspen consensus, and also coding criteria. What helped me understand was looking at this topic in these three parts. The mechanism of our coding process looks at the ICD-10-CM classification system, and these codes, E43, 44, and 44.1, are applied to cases by the physician. When a medical coder reviews the case and notes the diagnoses, they do not interpret independently, but apply a diagnosis-related group code 
using the existing documentation, which recognizes more specifics and details. The DRG code is matched for the billing process and also other factors indicating patient complexity. High severity DRG codes are severe protein counter malnutrition, which is an MCC, and there's another recognized level is a CC, which is a moderate severity. And how this all works is here on this slide. So you have when the, there's an ICD diagnosis, but then there's a DRG classification. And if you look on the left, the um, patient on the left has a lower score than those same areas on the right. And that was caused by the severe protein calorie malnutrition assignment. So the higher severity levels cause higher Medicare payments due to the increased cost for the complex patient. So um, now we're going to talk a little bit about documentation infrastructure. So the um, in PCM, there's emerged some issues and problems. And there still remains this dire need to have a common clinical understanding to describe adult protein calorie malnutrition. And so that's what international organizations are working on. But the science isn't all in on it either. And so it's in process, but it's getting closer. We know that it's underreported, under, undertreated, and unrecognized, and is actually a public health problem when you look at the community. Um, and there is few embedded preventative measures in healthcare. You know, people just don't think about it until it's an extreme case often. Malnutrition's root is rare, is rare and an acute event, which, you know, if you work in a hospital, it isn't rare at all. Um, it's, but, and if you look at the number of people in the community, even if it's a low percentage, that's a lot of people that are having problems with it before they get to the hospital. It's not always followed reliably as a clinical problem once it's diagnosed, especially in transitions of care. Um, patients aren't flagged with everybody seeing the patient doing something or paying attention to that. Um, it, we know that it's sporadic or no insurance cover, coverage for ambulatory prevention. And there's a lot of iatrogenic clinical practice that's still in place. I mean, I know all of us have issues with um, meal records getting recorded and weights getting recorded and things like that. And we also have this issue of who owns the nutrition problem, especially for complex patients, because they have so many doctors and one doctor will think, well, the other doctor is following that. And we're not really optimizing, I don't think, the use of the EHR for actually integrating patient dining information. Some of these sophisticated systems are able to do such things, and um, there's not been a lot of work done on that, but it's a huge opportunity for the inpatient side that we can actually use data from the dining services, because some of them are, have such good day nutrient data. And then the CMS reimbursements, reimbursement parameters aren't known already always and they sometimes can I, I think anyway be applied erratically by some auditors so when we layer the EHR documentation on top of that one of our foundational supports is the nutrition care process which supports our patient care CMS and other regulatory expectations another critical feature of the EHR is the use of structured data also called discrete data this is so important because it allows data to populate other areas such as notes and templates and to see sequential data from the past on the same topic so that you can see changes clinically or as a consequence of your treatment. The data can be pulled into notes and um, summary templates, which is really helpful in reducing the need to rewrite the same content multiple times, and it also prevents content errors. I really encourage clinicians to work with their analysts, coders, and teams to explore and optimize their EHR functionality. Sometimes the dietetics team, for example, is not even aware of the depth of the functionality that could reduce clicks and repetition, and it takes a lot of work to sort all that out. So the NCP is a comprehensive nutrition assessment performed by a dietitian. This is a critical point, and the coding process relies on the content for detailed and comprehensive evaluations. Evaluations are required for regulatory agencies and support the physician by providing detailed findings to consider in their medical diagnosis. What words we use and describe, you know, has another benefit as well, and that is having to do with higher levels of international naming and systems. The user-facing nutrition terms we use are mapped to federally mandated standard terminologies, including SNOMED and LOINC. This is really important and why we need to use the nutrition care process and terminology and build these terms into our nutrition assessment templates. 
This does not have a direct impact on coding, but I bring it up to support the concept of a comprehensive nutrition assessment and the important recognition of dietetics practice, which does impact coding. So to refresh, uh, the Academy Aspen adult consensus of protein calorie malnutrition is structured around this etiologic concept and is the foundation information, uh, actually the foundation metabolic information that was used for the Academy Aspen consensus that recognizes PCM in 2012. You can see that at the top there's case finding, case finding occurs and then it is determined if the patient is experiencing an inflammatory metabolic process or not. If not, we move to semi-starvation or starvation, and then if there is an inflammatory process, we have either a chronic or an acute type. And we also, um, the consensus characteristics include these six features, weight loss, for bo and both for severe and moderate forms, weight loss, inadequate energy intake, loss of muscle mass, loss of sub-Q fat, fluid accumulation, and a functional measure, and uh, grip strength often used for that. And then with our, we have these types, severity, duration, and characteristics. So we've got the three types. We've got severity. These are all important pieces of data. And then we have the clinical characteristics. And the other, the factor of time. And time is so important in nutrition, as we know, because of, you know, nutrient depletions and demands. And then we have these, you know, clinically significant events that occur on people. So we're trying to document all this and make sure all these features are included. So, you know, what happens to my notes after you write them? So with that background, we just talked about, and we're going to go through what happens. And if you thought you were mostly documenting to teams on your patient care unit, it may be unexpected to know that you are also documenting to many others, and actually probably more people <laughs> than you are on your unit. Um, all these professions have standards, uh, the professions have standards, and the agencies have standards and, and regulations, and we're all accountable for all of that. And we need to support all these activities so that we can get really good records of um, what is going on and the costs, like I said before. So to review, this is a general flow of what happens to our assessments and data. So the clinicians write their documents, in real time, there is a profession called documentation integrity specialist or documentation improvement specialist. This is a profession with standards and a very um, complex uh, way to get to be one. And they actually review charts following certain rules while the patient is in the hospital. And they're, they're wanting to make sure in real time that there is adequate evidence and clarification of the diagnosis. And once the patient's discharged, um, the um, medical coding uh, picks up the records and they extract um, and assign the DRG codes and then many other things and they drop the bill. And they usually are part of the facility compliance department a lot of times because there is a whole group of people who watch all this to make sure the hospitals are doing correct work. And then once the, the chart is gone and the, actually the reimbursement probably has been received, there's a group of professionals that are hired by, contra by um, CMS, and they're called recovery auditors, RAs, or they're also called recovery audit contractors, RECs. And they review the case and decide if there's evidence for the diagnosis and if the care was proper, and they can actually, they accept it or they can actually deny it. And they reject the case and can, if they deny it, they send it back to the facility and the facility reviews that and the facility can respond and tell why the case was actually coded right. And so they can have a back and forth um, and there's several tiers of this uh, discussion and appeals on why the case may or may not, may, may have been accepted, by, may have been rejected. And then at some point, CMS has a place where they can actually go to the level of a judge. And I was in a situation years ago that we decided not to go to that level but they can and it's really nice that there is appeal appeal process and the hospital compliance departments have policies and rules and how all this works and so they here's a summary of it again there's a comprehensive nutrition assessment and the nutrition diagnosis by the dietitian the physician assessment and the medical diagnosis the documentation integrity specialist can do a query if they there are certain structures they can follow and do that if they think there may be a need to clarify what's going on with the physician. The coders code the, di the DRG diagnosis. They um, drop the bill to CMS or the insurance. The bill's paid. And then the auditors 
you know, conduct their audits and they deny, or they can actually reduce the DRG code, code, code too. They, if, you, if you said it was severe and they decided it wasn't, they could make it a moderate. And then they notify the facility to, of the need to refund the original payment. And again, the facility may appeal the auditors. So the audit contractors, um, here's another summary of them. Um, and they are, you know, that was one of the, that's kind of the local individual case. And then the federal government looks at the, a number of cases like we had in that first slide. And they um, audit the records for documentation and coding that may be considered fraudulent and they want to assure proper payments. And it is our tax dollars, so you know, nobody wants to <laughs> waste them. What's interesting is they're not required to share criteria they use in their decision to accept or deny a code assignment. And sometimes they will write comments we'll look at in a minute. Um, and I really don't know if they're required to have any basic or advanced nutrition or metabolism course or stay current. And certainly uh, protein calorie malnutrition and other forms of malnutrition are very high level meta metabolic issues. So anyway, that's all what the summary of that is. And it's it, the summary report in July also told the contractors, so these, these contracting companies that have the recovery auditors, that they can recover over payments for severe PCM. And that is how those companies earn their money. They, they make their money that way. So I wanted to cover some audit rejection samples. So they, they communicate the rejection, which is a denial of reimbursement to the facility. And they sometimes will state the reason the record was denied. And, um, and I actually have experienced all these examples that I'm sharing today. I have experienced them at one time or another. And these are some of the things they say, that there's no albumin documented, the BMI was not less than 16, there wasn't enough documentation, which nobody knows what that means because nowhere in the rules does it say what is enough. And they didn't have any malnutrition at all, which, you know, like a clinician's going to waste their time on that. <laughs> Um, and malnutrition didn't ex impact the length of stay, or they had a form of malnutrition, but it wasn't the coded form. So the um, facility reviews the record, you know, this, re this denial, and they can make an appeal again. And often, sometimes you may have been called, a physician or dietitian will be called to review a case. And um, I have had that happen, and um, it is very, very interesting. And this was one example, this was a while back, but I was really upset about this one. And so when I'm asked to review the case, I pull out my references and I go through what was done wrong. And this was an interesting one because they kind of use Aspen criteria and GLIM criteria against one another, which tells me they really don't understand, you know, the intentions of that. But this is quite an elderly person, almost 80 years old, and their BMI was under 18. They were 5'4 and weighed 103 pounds. And as a clinician, if you saw just that information, you would know you have a clinical malnutrition problem just from your judgment. Um, but they also had some weight loss um, over some time constraint time patterns there. And they had some multiple comorbidities, including GI problems, which we know really influences um, inability to get adequate nutrition. And what the person had written, the auditor had written, was certain aspects of these criteria denote risk of malnutrition, but are not markers that validate the present. And they, they said GLIM casts doubt on validity of short-term weight loss as a criterion. So somehow they had interpreted something, the weight loss in GLIM against what the Aspen and what, what was said here. Um, and they disregarded all kinds of other parameters that we know impact malnutrition. So there, you get to write an appeal, and what I had done in, um, over the years was I get all my statements, my references, my policy statements, and my published literature, and if the, the, per, the auditor was wrong, I would just say that they, this was wrong, what this, this point of information was erroneous as evidenced by, and then I would do references and list it or, or quote things in the references that we commonly use, especially those by professional organizations. And I would describe the difference between the modern understanding of protein calorie malnutrition over historic misapplied and misunderstood criteria. Um, there's a lot, sometimes they'll come up with stuff with obese patients and um, they overinterpret albumin. They, um, they don't understand necessarily the weaknesses of BMI, especially related to body composition. And I will take excerpts from the EHR um, at, that are date, time, time and profession stamped 
um, examples in the HR documentation that refute what the denial stated was not true. So if they said there was, you know, there's no evidence of X, Y, Z, I would copy and have the timestamp, the professional and the quote um, of what the person did to say, well, you know, you were wrong. This is what actually happened. And I organized the appeals sometimes when I say I would write a record to the coder and then they would write they would take that information and they have templates and forms that they like to use and have a history with. But this would be my report to them basically. And I often would use the consensus criteria and I'd put, make a list of the consensus criteria and then extract the references and the patient's information that was conflicting with what the auditor said using each of the consensus criteria or, and also other information that I found from all the team. So this is a really important uh, point right here. Um, so the, the coding rules, you have the references down there and I would really encourage you to go look at those and they change every year. I haven't noticed big changes in the nutrition areas or things that would affect us, but it's really good every year. It comes out, I think in October for the next year, um, but this is the current 2021 and it's under the category code assignment and clinical criteria. And it says the assignment of a diagnosis code is based on the provider's diagnostic statement that the condition exists. The provider's statement that the patient has a particular condition is sufficient. Code assignment is not based on clinical criteria used by the provider to establish the diagnosis, which seems conflicting with what I just told you. But essentially the, the physician, this is saying the physician has, gets to decide because of the, they're a physician. But our nutrition assessment you know, we can't make a medical diagnosis. It's not in our scope of practice, but it is in our scope of practice to make a nutrition diagnosis and provide whatever evidence and findings we have. Protein calorie monitored nutrition is often a secondary diagnosis. The physicians make the primary diagnosis and then they, there is also secondary diagnosis. And as you've seen, they can have a long list of them. And this is also a really important thing when you think about what are we supposed to be writing to for making sure we're understanding in our case. The in, in re, when reporting additional diagnosis, they're interpreted as additional conditions that affect patient care in terms of requiring clinical evaluation or other therapeutic treatment or diagnostic procedures or extended length of stay or increased nursing care and our monitoring. So remember what um, that 2020 thing said about how malnutrition that they didn't describe the effect of malnutrition on patient care. These are the things that do describe the effect of malnutrition on patient care if we write them into our notes and make sure we're covering it. You know, why am I wanting to increase the protein here and do a indirect calorimetry? Why, what is nursing having to do to help to feed this patient or to offer the supplements, things like that? There's another concept that's called clinical validation, and this is uh, something that we all need to do, but the documentation uh, integrity specialists will often look for that because they know, you know what, to, what to look for. Um, but they, the clinical evaluate, validation is done by, often, most often by the documentation specialists and medical coding, and those are totally different professions. And they, the clinical documentation people do this during the stay, and they have a process where they can query the physician to clarify what the physician means if they think there's anything, you know, that they're unsure of in the clinical validation. And then the medical coders, they read the notes after the discharge and use those notes and those words to assign the MSDRG codes. There's also some APRDRG codes and other systems. But they cannot, the coders don't interpret or infer any physician notes or intentions. And these two functions are independent functions, they're independent workflows, and they have independent professional standards. So let's talk about trying to prevent some of these problems and what are some of the activities to help assure of evidence and reduce denials. Now, the, the idea of high quality documentation, these are some words that I've seen written when that area is discussed. Legibility, which has been really helped by the EHR, uh, reliability, clear, complete, consistent, direct, timely, and precise. So that's, you know, in, at the top of our brain about what we're trying to do. So I've come up with a list of preventative activities potentially um, that can help organizations address this. So using the professional literature-based definitions and clinical um, indicators is really strong. 
and again, Aspen and the Academy position papers and guidelines can really help if there's a patient that, you know, this is why you're doing it because you have those standards. And then if the denial, if there's a denial, you can use those papers to say, no, you were wrong. This is what we were doing and why. It's I'm expected as a professional standard. And you can also teach about malnutrition for, to physicians and the documentation specialists in an organization. I mean, people are very willing to understand this. They just need to have it described because remember, not hardly anybody gets nutrition in school anymore. Um, and they never really did. The ICD-10 conventions, guidelines, and advice can be shared in the organization to make sure everybody's on the same page. Um, again, we talked about clinical validation and we talked about the coding and integrity practices. And one of the things that I did want to make a point of today is the value of having medical staff and organizational approved policies, procedures, and guidance for coding and reporting. These are background documents that should actually probably go through the organization's clinical committees and get approval because it, it governs what you're doing in coding. And if you get in a denial situation where they're using you know, some standard that is nothing to do with what you already have set up that your organizational medical staff has approved as a standard, such as the consensus, you can, you can share that and say, look, this is what we as an organization are doing here to keep ourselves organized and to be sure we're compliant with all of the rules and use that. So, and then data analytics, um, these with the electronic records, you can set up a data analysis and they, the, I know the documentation uh, improvement people have methods of finding you know, errors and omissions to alert the compliance officers to avert risk. And you can also set up policies. And I've heard of places that for certain triggers, they'll have such and such person review every case before it goes out the door just to make sure they've got everything done right. And then also the, the compliance people and everybody needs to be aware of the federal compliance plans and what's going on. I wanted to talk about GLIM because that one case, for example, they were using it against it. And I know there's been a lot of uh, uh, discussions about this and a bit of confusion. And so I wanted to review this. Um, this is my understanding from reading and studying and talking to people just to make sure it, it is in its uh, a proper place. So GLIM is a framework developed by you, for use by clinicians who may have little nutrition background and who may not have access to registered dietitians who can perform a comprehensive nutrition assessment. It's not intended to be or replace a comprehensive nutrition assessment and professional organizations in the US are not advising it to, be re, to replace the consensus with GLIM. It's actually, if you look at it, it's a little more general than the Academy Aspen consensus and the Academy Aspen consensus fits within GLIM. So it, we want it to be consistent with GLIM for sure, and it is. Um, we, everybody is looking for ongoing research for core diagnostic criteria for a global consensus on what is malnutrition. Um, and so GLIM is not in conflict or intended to overshadow or replace the consensus, at least here in the United States. And I, I did learn that CMS is aware of the consensus and the GLIM framework and it does not endorse or require either or both, and it does not provide guidance to their auditors for either or both. And I, I think sometimes the recovery auditors are applying their own interpretations of either or both. So um, it, it, I just wanted to share that because I think there's a lot of confusion and I know the professional organizations are really studying this because everybody wants the common goal of really figuring out who's malnourished and, and how we're gonna manage it and treat it and document it. So, and there is a lot of value of having a common, common global diagnostic criteria. But the thing that's nice about GLIM is that the regional criteria can be applied because countries and people, you know, programs have different historical um, demands. And I think with GLIM, one of the big differences has got to do with BMI because for years we've been aware that the um, BMI is not at, at the normal or much of the obese levels is not necessarily indicative of the patient's nutrition. And I'll talk about that in a minute because of the body composition. Um, and also it allows research applications. So if I'm doing research in one country and another country, we can, we can have a common understanding that my populations were aligned so that we can do our research and interpret it properly. So, and, and it requires a validation and reliability testing 
and all that, just like um, the consensus. So, and again, they are expert opinion and consensus, and I, I think they're really heading in the same and the right direction. So I did want to cover that a bit. So I wanted to go over some denial issues, um, kind of the modern clinical care compared to some of the denial rationale. And there is, uh, and I think it still shows up, overpayments that the RAs say um, need to be reversed because an albumin, because of an albumin measure, you know, and because so, and it, but it's funny because sometimes they they accept them because of albumin, and sometimes they don't, they, they reject them, and sometimes they'll uh, reference what I showed you previously about who and some of the other records um, plus albumin, so they they kind of mix and match um, things sometimes. And sometimes they'll use the consensus and albumin. And so they just, it's kind of a broad variety of things that go on with those reference for that. So that's where you pull out the Aspen consensus that was recently published about uh, visceral proteins. I find that really useful and it's a really great time for education. And if you're doing a denial, then you can reference that in the denial. Another thing that kind of happens that's kind of awkward, I think, is if um, a, a dietitian would get a referral based on an albumin, because you're really happy the physician's aware of the nutrition and you don't want to hurt that relationship at all. Um, and so sometimes you can come up, this is kind of a long version of uh, an explanation, I'll let you read yourself, but the idea is that you're trying to educate, not reject what they were trying to do, which was right. And that's, again, where you can use some of these national standards and policies. So like for the Aspen one, again, on the visceral proteins. And actually, there's a really good podcast, if you haven't heard that, that goes along with that. And I believe it's open source. And I've got some other lists there. So we, you know, you can make a packet of this information. And depending on the physician or the nurse or whoever is coming, uh, discussing this, you can use the opportunity to educate. But you can also use it for the denials. This is um, from a famous uh, group, and it's interesting because these criteria for malnutrition are listed in this one document, and that's what I remember in the 1970s, uh, late 1970s, that we thought was malnutrition, but nobody that I know of uses this anymore. The only thing on here did recognize low BMI in seniors. Um, but if the auditor uses that, I think it's a good opportunity to say that you know, you don't use this anymore. And if your organizational policy says what you do use, you can share that. I do want to talk about the BMI because the, remember the, the um, I'll talk about a little more right now with the, the who, but like this, for example, was BMI and a lower on the BMI on the MNA tool, which is a screening or assessment tool. Um, there is a low where the lower score is worse. Um, a BMI 23 is a three and so that means the patient's okay but if the bmi is less than 23 they start accumulating points and if you look at the bmi and all-cause mortality you can see that for old, older adults less than 23 and aspen also has some statements on that i think it's uh, 22 or 23 also so be aware of that and you can convey this information if they say your patient's not malnourished because their bmi is not 16 and if you wonder where that comes from, um, the severe malnutrition comes from the World Health Organization in a book that is a manual for workers um, that is used in refugee camps. And this was published in 1999. And there's a very brief paragraph about adults in this document. And this is where that low 16 BMI comes from. And I, I think that any senior that's below 16 is way, way, way worse off. And I um, where, no, regardless of where they live, but they're basically saying your patients are not, not severely malnourished because they're not a 16 BMI. So this is inappropriate to use this document in developed nations with, you know, with health systems that aren't, I mean, they're using a refugee camp standard for a modern health system. So I think that can be pointed out. And the other thing that can be pointed out is all this work that's being done on on muscle mass. And on the left, we have obese patients with different muscle mass, but the same BMI. And on the right, we have a different BMI with low muscle masses. And you can see there's a broad difference in people. And this is um, showing the, the, the low muscle mass is showing up in morbidity and mortality. And so if they're using BMI, you can tell them from your physical exam, or if you're lucky enough to have other imaging that this patient 
um, required different treatments and it had a different risk because of the muscle mass. And there's some real good articles here, and I think I added some also in your handout, but these are good things to talk about if you have a denial. Now I've got some suggestions, and there's really no guarantees, um, but um, we'll go through those. And again, facility coding guidelines, creating coding guidelines for your organization, authenticating them through your com committee approval process and everything is really important. And that will be kind of a backbone that you can, can use. The um, EHR functionality can help with your documentation. Really learn it. You can um, do a lot with it. And sometimes I found that we didn't know that we should have been doing something or we didn't know that we should have called somebody and said, help us. We have a, a workflow problem here. Can, is there any functionality that can help us? There's a lot of technology with dot phrases and using the um, structured data, like I said, and then making sure the whole team's involved in those discussions so you can have really strong uh, flow. And again, the foundation, again, would be the comprehensive nutrition assessment and using the nutrition care process model and using those terms. I wanted this part here about why um, you, you need to document why the type and severity of malnutrition matter. Because remember, we have these different diseases, we have the different body compositions, and your interventions and treatments um, and the impact on patient care of that is really important to outline and, and describe. And a really a good example is refeeding syndrome. For many of the, most of the malnutrition that we see a lot of it, there is potential risk for refeeding syndrome. When you say you're doing a certain treatment because there's a risk for reading feeding syndrome and you're monitoring this or you're having the nurse have to add uh, supplements or protein powders or something, those are things that, that related to malnutrition that impact patient care. And the readers, you know, if you came down and told me, it's like, oh, I'm doing, I'm adding this because this patient's really sick. I know, and I know what you mean. I know exactly what you mean. But the readers downstream do not know necessarily what you mean. And they think, oh, that's nice. So I'll show you some of that in a second. Um, there is a feature called uncertain diagnosis. And sometimes people say, well, I can't because I don't have all the data. Well, you can, there is room in inpatient to suggest that your pa you could treat your patient as if they had a problem and you outline the information that you have and then hopefully you can get it during the stay to clean it up and make a complete um, analysis of what type of malnutrition they have. But if you can't, you can, if you can't get it, you can still treat them as because you need a care plan and you need to be able to say the rationale with your treatment. So you can go ahead and do that. And then once you get more information, you can adjust it because you don't want to delay treatment for your patient. Another interesting point is when you use the term history of in an inpatient setting, it in the coding rules, it means that it doesn't exist anymore. So I think it's awfully important to, because most of our patients are coming to us with problems already, to really outline the time frame and what happened and what their struggles are. And you can use you know, quotes from the pet patient or the family, um, but outline that time frame because if they have a history of malnutrition is read by an auditor, they are going to interpret it like, well, it was in the past and they were fine when they got to the hospital often. So you need to be aware of that. And I just think just outlining from the nutrition history what happened. Weight errors are a big problem. And uh, you're, you can wait, wait for weights if you can ask somebody to get one for you, or maybe you can do one yourself. Summarizing the weight history. There, some EHRs have a great functionality that can show the history from the ambulatory to the inpatient side. Um, but you do need to take care of your patient right now with your best clinical judgment and then update it when you can get it. And you can also do quality projects on this weight. I find that it has a lot to do with the culture and on um, units where the physicians demand the weights because of fluid or anything, it's done better than some other floors. This is just really important for us and we need it. So we need to try to figure out how to get it. <laughs> In our documentation, we need to clearly describe nutrition gaps here are some things, uh, state the nutrient targets and why the targets exist, you know, um, measure them in actual numbers and percentages and specify that your intervention is to reduce this gap. Because again, you're, everybody on your unit will know what you mean, but the people downstream may not without specifying it. Mathematics is really useful to quantify intake, weight changes and timeframes. 
it's just all really important. And I, I know this sounds like a lot of writing, but I think when you really think about it, work on it, maybe you can use the structure data to make it more easy, easier. So I wanted to give you some real quick examples, what I think are stronger documentation, because you know, weight loss before admission, I know that's a problem. Our readers don't necessarily know. And so by quantifying it, saying what the weight loss is, the time frame, the percentages, what is poor intake? Describe poor intake and what they're doing. That is very powerful information. Patients weak, describe the weakness. What can they do? What is a, try to quantify it. A high protein milkshake is an intervention and this actually happened to us one time. Um, the re auditor had rejected it because it wasn't an intervention. And I'm like, you know, and I had to think about that for a long time and I figured out that whoever audited this decided that giving a milkshake was just something nice and fun for the dietitian to do with the patient to be nice. And I'm like, oh my gosh, <laughs> that's not why we give a high protein milkshake. If you came to the office and said, hey, I gave my patient a high protein milkshake, I know why you gave the high protein milkshake to the patient, but other readers don't. So if you can put it into nutrition specific terms by why you did it, how it compared to the goals, I have a sample there, you know, that it adds 20 grams of protein. They're needing nine, they've only been getting 50. You know, things like that really are important. And then, um, there's some comments about albumin because people are still, even with what you do, they're not going to understand it. So maybe describe that in starvation state metabolism, yes, they will have a pretty normal um, albumin, um, you know, and because they don't, people don't understand, but you can describe that. Obese and weak, it would probably be better to describe what the physical exam, what you uncover in the physical exam, and also that it require the patient is so weak, they require nursing assistance to eat or to drink. Because those, again, are how malnutrition impacts patient care. Um, for high calorie and protein needs, you can say that too, but if you put in what is the target, what's the deficit, what's the difference, and what am I doing to fix this, and why this is bad, they're not going to heal. If you can describe any of that, and I got wordy there for the slide just so you can read what I'm saying, understand what I'm saying, but those are really important things. And then also the term malnutrition itself, there's lots of different types of malnutrition. And we're talking about protein calorie malnutrition, and we're talking about specific etiologies of that. So spell that out a few times in the note. I know it's a lot of long words, but if you spell it out a couple times, then it's there, and then maybe you can just use the term malnutrition in other spots. COVID has been really a struggle for everybody to get adequate evidence, I know, but all you can do is the best you can do. And I know maybe people have asked for other people's eyes that are going into the room, to help, but these people are high risk for acute inflammatory type of protein malnutrition. And sometimes people don't think that's real. Um, they don't understand that it's a huge metabolic change. So describe it. Connect clinical information and interpret the information for your downstream reader. I mean, why are we applying an intervention for the downstream reader so they can understand it? How malnutrition has impacted the patient's abilities, um, on their ability to care for themselves, on their functional ability. You can create nutrition care process templates, smart phrases, et cetera, in the, in the electronic record and educate the patient and include a direct information about why nutrition is critical for their condition. For example, if you're educating somebody because they have a surgical wound and nutrition will impact their surgical wound, their surgical wound healing, it's good to if you can write something like that because the record then will show that there was a problem and you had an intervention and the rationale for it and why it was important. And then finally, you know, you can work with the analysts. I just can't say that enough. They're just brilliant and they have very clever, creative ways of helping dietetics and others connect all the nutrition, you know, the nutrition information. So in summary, I would like to encourage everybody to document all their available evidence make a really strong case for your patient. When the BMI is low or pertinent, go ahead and use it. Um, and if it's normal or high, you may need to describe the lean mass uh, issues with that and the connection to inflammatory diseases. Um, you know, make the connections for the reader between your clinical information and what the coding information needs. Make sure to connect with compliance, coding, and documentation. And professionals have interprofessional education and communication. 
Um, it's just so interesting, and I just love working with the people that we, uh, when I was working, had access to um, policies and procedures. I can't emphasize that enough. I really think that protects you. And then when you have it in aisle, you can invoke that. Make sure you can do chart reviews to help everybody. You can do peer chart reviews to help make sure everybody's trying to do the right thing. Educate and teach and discuss metabolism in the teaching rounds. Go to grand rounds. Um, ask to be a speaker at some time on your topic. Um, and I also, the industry, there's a lot of industry that does different continuing educations on coding as well as nutrition topics that can help enhance everybody's understanding. I would encourage everybody to appeal every rejection if it's clinically justified. Many times I contacted our compliance and coding people. I said, if you have one, you call me. I really want to go through that because I wanted to see what was going on, but I also felt very strongly that these patients that with this malnutrition should not be lost or ignored. And then finally, make sure you have adequate evidence to support your diagnosis. So I will now turn that over um, back and I appreciate your time and interest and I really hope this is helpful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Therese, um, just for such an excellent and timely presentation. And now we will address questions from the attendees. We have quite a few, so let's go. First question, can a doctor just sign the dietitian's assessment as evidence and documentation of the malnutrition diagnosis? You know, I've known places that do that, and my understanding is that there is a mechanism to do that, but it's very much tied to policies and procedures and protocols. So if you don't have in your organization an infrastructure that identifies exactly what's going on, and they still have to comply with all the coding rules, if you can work through that, then I think it would be okay. But just to set it up that it's just a signature is probably going to be a bit dangerous because the of the the treatment part the doctor has to say that the patient was treated for this and what was done so i i think there's a way through it um, if you really want to do that i am hesitant personally but i know places do it and i think they must need this uh, a very strong policy and procedure infrastructure okay so can you diagnose malnutrition without a physical assessment what if you're unable to obtain the physical mm -hmm. assessment? Yeah, the consensus criteria say to a minimum of two criteria. So you'd have to come up you know, with two criteria. So often weight loss and intake, I think, are probably what we use more often. I, um, I think those are two very strong indicators. And if you can't do a physical exam, I really would encourage you to learn how to do it. It's not that hard. It's really fun. And you'd get a lot of information about a patient and what's going on. So yeah, you can. I think this is a comment that says from one of our participants, actually the comment is actually COVID makes um, nutrition focused physical exams easier as the illness is so dramatic on nutrition losses. So yeah, I, that's a really good comment. And I tell you back in May of last year there, I don't know if you saw it on Facebook, there was a nurse, I think he was a nurse and he was a robust build fellow and then he got COVID and he showed a pre-COVID and a COVID picture of him on public on Facebook. And I was, I felt bad for him, but boy, was I glad to see that photo because we, I have had people push back that acute disease related malnutrition doesn't exist. And I'm like, yes, it does. Infections and all this. And that was a classic example. And he was just in the post COVID. He had lost his deltoid. He'd lost his, you know, he was squared off here. You could see temple. Um, it was a very powerful photo, and I, I agree with the statement that person commented to very much. So we have a couple of questions um, related to cachexia versus severe protein calorie malnutrition. Mm -hmm. Can you comment on coders using cachexia versus severe PCM? Yeah, <laughs> that, there is a lot of work going on on that, and I would refer you to, there's a society of Oh, it's SWCD, the Wasting Diseases, and they, oh shoot, I always forget the name of that journal, but they're doing a lot of work on it, and it's really, really interesting, and there is getting to be more of a consensus on what is cachexia, and to me, cachexia is kind of like an extreme state of the uh, chronic um, disease-associated malnutrition, 
um, but they have some, there's different parameters and cut points that are that are showing up for kikexia. So, and people with kikexia, um, there's there's also work going on on pre-kikexia and then kikexia and then the severe side of kikexia. So they're even breaking that down into three parts. And actually the earlier stages, there is some treatment for that. So it's still, you know, in um, kind of that research phase, but there are some national standards on that. And I can't quote them to you right now, but um, work is being done. So I still, um, your patient will have been malnourished. It's just that the treatments aren't going to work at the very final stages of kikexia, but they are still got there by being malnourished. Part of it, part of how they got there was malnourished. It's just a different metabolism. Okay, thank you. Metabolism, I guess. Yeah. Have you ever heard of auditors saying that clinical documentation specialists should not list severe protein calorie malnutrition if the dietitian di uh, states that it was moderate protein calorie malnutrition? Yeah, that, see, there's a really important point that's behind that. So that's why you want to have communication with these groups because you don't want your me medical record to have the doctor say one thing, the DIS is to say one, and the dietitians to say one. And it's a tough situation. So one of the things that I think helps is to have meetings with and educate each other. Um, one of the things that I was very lucky that people I worked with invited me to come speak and talk about what the dietitians are doing and what they're seeing and how we interpret all that. And I also invited them, the, co the documentation specialists, to contact me if there was anything, any questions, because we really do need to try to sync this up. Um, because it doesn't help if you have that going on in the chart because the auditor is always going to go to the least serious uh, problem. Um, so I think communication and education and, you know, and sometimes, you know, people do stuff that may not like to be done and you have yeah, to work yeah. through that. So it's a tough one. I, and I think the EHR can maybe help with some of that too. Oh. Okay, I think we'll be able to take just a couple more questions. Um, you had a slide including a sample internal message um, or communication on albumin. Mm -hmm. Is that message in, included in the dietitian EMR note or is it intended to be sent privately to the provider? Yeah, I think we did both. I think that one we tended to use more privately because mm -hmm. you don't, you would, if you were going to include it in the record, you wouldn't want it to look conflicting. So I okay. believe we set that up for more private communication. Okay. But we still wanted them, we wanted to appreciate the other, I think some of them, actually we did put them in the chart note too, because we wanted to recognize what they were trying to do um, and make it positive. Because it was that they were referring, it's just this patient wasn't malnourished based on an albumin. Exactly. And I think this might be the last question that we have time for. There certainly are many, and I wish we could get to all of them. Can hospitals discuss their medical standards of using the Academy Aspen criteria with their payers? Yes. In fact, that is something I think people really need to look at. Um, what you could do is, you, I would guess I would describe it as negotiate with your payers because there's insurance companies as well as CMS and the DRG system in regular non-Medicare insurance can use this too and sometimes they'll deny it. If you had your program outline because your medical staff really is the authority with this and the medical staff you know working with the teams decides we're going to do x y and z there is no reason they can't go to the insurance companies and say look this is what we're doing this is malnutrition let me educate you i mean a dietitian i'd go talk to an insurance company and tell them this i'm sure there's a lot of dietitians that would and you can discuss it with them and that might help Honestly, years ago, one of the cases came through that I was just appalled at. The patient was really malnourished and it had been denied. And I called up um, one of our coding people and I said, this is ridiculous. You know, what can I do? And she actually gave me the name of the business that was contracted to do our, the service to our organization. And I called them and they can't really tell me anything, but I was able to tell them about the consensus tell them about how co controlled we are with our policies and we managed it through our nutrition committee that we, you know, it was an organizational approach to keep us organized so that we can be compliant and it was evidence-based from our professional organizations. And I, I did that and 
it, I think it helped. It didn't hurt anything, but at least, and I sent them the records. I sent them all the references and the policies. So um, I think it's a good idea. It surely shouldn't hurt. Okay, thank you, Therese, for such an excellent and relevant presentation and so informative. And I wanna thank everybody for attending this session today. On behalf of the Nestle Nutrition Institute, we hope that you found this information useful to your practice. Thank you and have a wonderful day.